Welcome to the IoT Powering the Digital Economy, Demand in a Connected World, CNBC Debate. Let me introduce today's topic. It's called Powering the Digital Economy, Demand in a connect Connected World. There's a whole host of amazing stats you're going to see in the piece of video we're going to run in a short while. But I'm just going to say, my name is Steve Sedgwick. I've been covering energy, and I've just realized I've been covering energy for 30 years. Um, first, uh, as a trader, where I was trading stocks such as BP, Shell, Lasmo, Ultramar, some real odd names that perhaps people like Ian would know very well as well. Um, and then as a journalist as well, and I've been covering a whole host of events and, and several of you have been at those events as well. Uh, COP21, which was an absolute pivotal moment as well. I cover a lot of um, old industry as well. I cover the OPEC meetings, um, energy forums throughout the world as well. But what I want to do uh, is start off uh, by bringing up to the stage Jean-Pascal Tricoir, who is the CEO uh, of Schneider Electric. And we're going to have a conversation now, um, just a little conversation, about four or five minutes, about where we're at, how much progress we've made, and where we still need to make progress. So nice to see you, first of all. You said my name almost correctly for once, right? <laughs> As opposed to... Yeah, oh, no, 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 it's fine. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm amazed that there are so many people, it's already late here, everybody has had a very busy day, so clearly the subject is of interest because uh, the room is full. Uh, where, what have we done? What have we achieved in the field of energy? Well, I've been working almost the same time as you in this field, almost 30 years, and I think we've seen more changes in the field of energy in the past five years that we've seen not in the past 30 years, but in the previous 100 years. And, and when you look at it, it's about the fast emergence of renewables and storage and, and things like this that, that push the energy to be completely decentralized and closer to the point of consumption. And, and the massive thing is digitization. And, and this is called powering the digital economy, but you could, you could call it digitizing the power economy. Because the power economy, and power is the base of life, uh, we say at Schneider that we do technologies that make sure that life is on. Because if you don't have access to energy, you can't educate yourself, you, can't, you have issues of hygiene and everything. So power is the base, energy is the base of life. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say that, the whole chain of energy is vastly inefficient. There are losses all over, and especially buildings are 80% inefficient, cities 80% inefficient. Even industries that have worked on their productivity are 60% inefficient. Digitizing, connecting everything from the power plant to the plug brings unparalleled levels of efficiency. On, on this is all Internet of Things, paired with big data, paired with analytics, AI, and it's happening now. Mm -hmm. And it's happening now, at the same time when we discovered we have a climate change issue that we have to resolve. So we are the generation, first generation to know, and first generation, thanks to decentralized energy, digitization, able to resolve the problem. So I pulled out a bit of um, tape from you and I at the COP21 talks as well, in Paris as well. And you said to me, the technology is already there for renewables. But what about the price of that technology to make it more accessible and more widespread? Have we made as much progress in the last two years on that as well as creating better products as well? First, since, since we talked like two or three years ago, things have again dramatically changed. If you take since 2010, renewable prices have fallen by 70%, battery costs by 40%. So what used to be true is not true anymore. So those things are really becoming, the, the, the coupling of renewable together with storage is becoming really affordable. And you have now many, many countries on many places uh, where they have reached grid parity. Mm -hmm. So it's all evolution that we have to drive and drive uh, really in an accelerated manner. That with utilities, we manage all the complexity of that beautiful network, where suddenly now you have surges of electricity because there is wind, or surges because there is sun. Uh, we are working hard on the first source of energy, the cheapest, the greener, the easiest, the fastest to implement, which is energy efficiency. What technology are we missing? I mean, one can point to the cost of storage, the um, lack of grids in certain parts as well to move that energy to where it's needed at the right time as well. But what are we missing technologically that you think could make the next leap? I think we've got everything we need to a very large extent uh, today already. Uh, what you can expect is that uh, probably the, the technology that will make most progress in the next years to come is batteries for storage. Mm -hmm. And they are the natural complement to uh, renewables. 
to, uh, to stabilize the grid and to stabilize and to make your source of generation uh, close to your consumption. I mean, houses will be uh, quite a lot autonomous in the future. A lot of buildings will be net positive. We already do net positive buildings with a better efficiency on, on generating power on, on the point where, the, where it's consumed. So I, I would say the technologies are here. Yeah, um, um, and now you've got this massive injection of uh, software analytics to, to bring on of AI somewhere to coordinate all that and make sure that we make a far better usage from energy. What about digitalization or powering the digital economy for everyone? Not just for rich Western nations, not for, and we'll cover this, countries like Saudi Arabia, which are making huge transformations, but actually can, can start cities from scratch in the desert as well uh, and use the brightest and the best technology. What about, and this is, again, let's say something that's very important for all of us, it for everybody, for India, for Africa, for other countries as well? Yeah, I, I would start by, uh, by really giving the priority to people who don't have access at all to energy. So you're speaking about the 1.3 billion. It's a lot of people on Earth who don't have access to energy. And there, everything I was referring to before is a great solution because you don't need the grid. It can be very local. It's easy to deploy, much easier than, than the previous solutions. Mm -hmm. So we are working a lot on that. If you look at the past... Right. Only our company, three million uh, uh, households, that four million actually, that got electricity, trained 150,000 electricians to uh, make that possible on the field, and so that they would maintain the insulation. So that electrification is happening. And when you have electricity, then you start uh, a new life. Now, when you speak about the creation of new cities, like it happened in Saudi Arabia. Recently, I was in Egypt, a uh, new creation of uh, three very new cities. Uh, you can think very new, uh, the, old, uh, the old structure. And even in emerged economies, you see people installing microgrids mm -hmm. to merge together, or put together renewable storage, use the grid also, and get an electricity which is greener and, and cheaper. Right. So those changes are happening everywhere. Fabulous. I hope you're going to get involved in the conversation as we move on, but uh, thank you very much indeed for now. Thank you. I'll take that from you if you like. Yeah. Cool. And that. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much indeed for the scene set of there. What I'm going to do now is run a little bit of tape so you can see uh, what we're going to be doing in this and some of the challenges, of course, of getting so many people who are going to be need so much power in the 21st century. Let's roll the tape. The world is experiencing unprecedented urban growth, which looks set to continue. For the first time in human history, more than half of all human beings live in the city. So therefore, solutions that we generate or formulate, urban solutions, may have relevance elsewhere. The rise of emerging economies will provide opportunities, but it will also pose challenges, including the increased need to power our planet. The demand for natural resources is rising. This rising emerging market demand is going to put an awful lot of pressure on natural resources. The big unknown here is how quickly supply can respond, how quickly efficiency changes. Governments are under pressure to meet climate change targets as CO2 emissions continue to increase. Suddenly all the automakers are announcing electric vehicles. It's partly what they are driven to by the market, but they're also driven by policy. Emerging markets will require major investment in order to provide universal access to more sustainable and affordable power. The solution may lie in becoming smarter and more efficient with the energy we use today in order to secure a brighter tomorrow. But how can this be achieved? In the age of IoT, do innovative technologies hold the key to solving this global dilemma? How can we reduce the demand side through efficient technology to turn the tide and finally drive down raw material extraction, production of CO2 and the need for infrastructure? While business and thought leaders pioneer a smarter, more sustainable future, our connected world means we all have a role to play. The time to act and deal with this demand is now. Welcome to the IoT Powering the Digital Economy, Demand in a Connected World, CNBC Debate.
Okay, and don't forget the rules of engagement. If somebody says something you're interested in, get involved in this as well. This is our panel. Uh, I'm not going to do great big bios. You can find those all on, on the WEF top link as well. But Bernd Leukert is a member of the executive board uh, for product and innovation at SAP. Good to see you, sir. Uh, Akon, co-founder of Akon Lighting Africa, just Grammy-nominated, multi-million-selling uh, music guru, entrepreneur, you name it. In fact, to prepare for this panel today, I did actually listen to Akon music all afternoon. I have to say, it was absolutely got me in the right zone as well. Um, Fahad, I didn't listen to any of your music, I'm afraid, as well. But uh, Fahad Al-Rashid, who is the group CEO and MD of Emar Economic City, we talked about cities being built from nothing as well. Well, I'm sure you've all checked out the King Abdullah Economic City as well. It's just going to have 2 million people living there with an investment of uh, $100 billion? Plus. Plus. Plus inflation. Plus inflation as well. Oh, inflation's back. Well, better tell the central bankers in Europe. Uh, and Tulsi Tante, I'm afraid you can't get rid of me, sir. We've already had a spoke, uh, conversation this Davos as well. Founder and chairman of Suzlon Energy, uh, wind, solar, and, and correct me if I'm right, but you've put in 10,000 megawatts of wind installations, powering potentially 5 million households equivalent in India as well. So, I mean, it's huge. Uh, pedigree and a great panel as well. Uh, Bernd, let me start off with you as well. I'm just going to go down the line as well, but that's as formal as I'm going to get in this conversation, as I say. Once I've done that, then it's going to be open season as well. Blunt question, is SAP doing enough? Uh, are the customers driving it? Are you driving it as well? Uh, and with specifically in power in mind, just tell us where we're at for one of the biggest software companies. Now, first of all, I want to thank everybody that I have the honor of uh, talking in a power industry panel uh, this means that software and digitization is present and it's not a future vision. Now coming back to your question, um, I, I just learned that uh, power is the source or is giving the life to people and our mission is that we make the world run better and improve people's life. How are we doing this? We want to enable our customers, Schneider Electric and more than 300,000 uh, customers on the planet to win in the digital economy. And uh, connectivity of things, connectivity of people, we call it internet of things, we should call it internet of things and people, uh, is the basis for that. And I consider us as the enabler for that. There are other technology companies who have another strategy. Because you asked, are we doing enough? Mm -hmm. They have a strategy to disrupt the industry while we stick to what made us strong, being the technology advisor and enabler for future success of the company. And let me give you three points on what we think is essential for doing it. In that world of connectivity, we need to have a dialogue with customers on how to introduce new business model. I think we will discuss this later in the panel. Number two, we are entering a world of openness and collaboration. So breaking down silos mm -hmm. and connect with other companies is not natural because a lot of success in history of companies was built on organic innovation and growth only. And number three, and don't forget this, it's when we talk about renewable energy and, and the nice video as an intro, I am convinced that sustainable Internet of Things uh, will only work if we measure with KPIs the impact on our environment. That's okay. what we are doing for our customers. All right, so a big focus on the key performance indicators going forward. Akon, you've been anti-establishment. Your words to me earlier on in the green room as well. Anti-establishment so far, but to scale up your projects, helping people get energy, get lighting in Africa as well, you've got to join up with the establishment as well. That's kind of why you're here to learn about what the World Economic Forum is about as well. What is your message to the people here and indeed about what needs to be done and how to work with these big companies? Um, ultimately, with me, the reason why I was so anti-establishment starting is because I like to move fast. And unfortunately, when you're with the establishment, everything's moved slower. For whatever reason, it just, it's supposed to move faster, it just doesn't. I'm like, these guys have all the resources, have all the money, but they can't move. So I just moved on my own and utilized my network, my fan base, uh, the people that's interested to have the same passion of what I wanted to do. And that's how we got the projects actually going. But as you start to move forward, you run into a lot of roadblocks. And there's a lot of red tape that's actually wrapped around you because the things that you need to get into to an extent is all controlled by the establishment. So now you have no choice but to play ball. And my whole idea is, OK, 
everything is disruptive nowadays. Everything's changing. The world is not the same. Even now, the establishment themselves have to you know, convert to the change. So I felt the timing was perfect, because as much as they don't want to uh, you know, comply with today's disruptive you know, generation and what's going on digitally and in the future, they have no choice now but to do it, because otherwise they will be left behind. So I looked at it as an opportunity to be a part of that change and utilize that as a benefit to convince them on why they should move faster moving forward, because the digital age is moving so fast. As you blink your eye, there's new updates, there's new technology, there's new, I mean, kids are growing up, coming up with these ideas, and you're trying to explain it to your elders, and they're looking at you like, what? <laughs> you know, so even when you look at blockchain and how that's moving, with the currency exchanges and how that's moving, they, they're going to play a huge role into tomorrow's economy on how that moves. And that's going to completely you know, shake up the, the financial system. So you just have to look at things as, OK, there is a change. It has to be done. Now, how does that work with what I'm doing today? And how does that correlate to success? And that's just really been my mind state. And that was one of the reasons that brought me to Davos, is to kind of listen to the conversation, see where everyone's going, understand the establishment's point of view, and then figure out how does that work into a collaboration to where it can be successfully driven in a fast-paced route. Uh, and briefly, do you understand the challenges? For, and I want the establishment to answer back, by the way. Feel free. You are all the establishment, most of you. Um, do, do you understand from their point of view a bit more why things are so, so slow? Or actually, no? Do you say, no, I don't get it. You guys are, are living in the past. Well, I'm actually understanding a lot. And I think a lot of it has to do with agendas. Um, everyone has a specific agenda that needs to be fulfilled. Hmm. And I think it's all in conversation at the end of the day. You know, ultimately, when you are in balance of power and control, you don't want to really hear that side when that side has an, an idea that just may overcome the extra, the extra leverage that you may use. Hmm. And we're in a state where leverage has to be used responsibly. You know, I mean, there's innocent people that's actually been affected by these decisions. And it's only a handful of people that make the decisions for a mass of people. So we got to get to the point where we have to humanize these decisions. And it can't all be about money, because at the end of the day, when we're all not existing, the money won't even matter. Establishment, who wants to pick that one up? I'll pick on someone. Um, CEOs, chairmen, you've got boards, you've got shareholders. You have to move in a certain direction. You have to move at a certain pace. You have to move cautiously as well. Um, you know what it's like building a company as well, uh, with those constraints as well. Um, do you understand the frustrations of the anti-establishment building up scale, how hard it can be uh, to make that breakthrough as well? Do you understand the constraints? Yeah, it's, a, it's a, every entrepreneur and every the pioneer leader says to pass through the most difficult paths. Then he can enjoy that difficulties when the success has come. Mm. Some people can just build a, a city from scratch and <laughs> learn what others have made mistakes. Actually, you can almost be the anti-establishment establishment because you don't have to abide by the rules of um, working with the current constraints as well. So can you really learn from what others have made mistakes, what the establishment is doing uh, on this process, and actually hear what Akon is saying and move very, very quickly? Or do you still have to move at a very slow pace, given your shareholders? I mean, this is about regulatory uh, entrepreneurship, if you will, challenging the system um, constantly. But I can tell you that on, in the area of energy use, uh, that we still don't know how to design, to design efficient cities. We launched Cake 10, 12 years ago, and the first design, global design firm, by the way, global design firm, I, will, I don't want to mention the name. Um, the city in the middle of the desert had canals, and we had no water. And then you say, great, fantastic, this must be for other use. Is it uh, going to be um, um, storm-proof? They said, no, it's only 10 years protected from a major flood. I said, OK, so what are we doing? Uh, apparently, we overbuilt our cities. We pour too much concrete. We are ecologically unfriendly. And that was just 10 years ago, a global firm. And so we've changed the master plan four times over the past 10 years to make it more ecologically friendly. And by the way, it's cheaper, more friendly environment, more friendly to people. And so my concern today is actually about the future. The reality is nobody knows how autonomous cars, internet of things, the sharing economy is going to change our cities. We all think we know, we have theory, but I'm building today. 
I'm starting off on decarbonisation as one of the first yeah. pointers that we're going to go through here as well. But 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 it's, this is not just about <coughs> renewables. This is about the the, the, the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, as well. The things we can do without having to necessarily need a, a, a complicated digital economy. So I'm almost taking a step back before we go forward as well. Uh, and you've got some comments on this as well, because I know we were talking about this earlier on as well, about the progress that can be made even before we get into the digital economy. And then the digital economy can monitor some of those very easy things we can do? Well, the digital economy today takes use about 10% of global energy uh, demand, basically. It's significant. Mm -hmm. Actually, data centers alone use 2% or, or produce 2% of carbon emissions. It's more than the aviation industry. So it is significant going, but... You should try doing a Bitcoin trade. I mean, I, I, seriously, yeah. Acon, they, they take a lot of service space as well. <laughs> <laughs> but 40% of our energy use is still in buildings. Our buildings are all inefficient because they, you know, basically designed wrong. So I think they, the focusing on area like efficiency, which is not as sexy as talking about investing in renewables, is actually a very important way forward. Today, out of the total production of renewables, it's, the total energy mix, 15 to 20% is renewable. So we still have a long way to go in terms of making renewable have a big impact in terms of, of, of carbon emissions. We have to focus on energy efficiency more than anything else. And I think the, the reality of the matter is, Governments, establishments, need to work on their regulations. Because now renewables are actually cheaper than uh, using fossil fuels for production of energy. So, you know, this is a different world, and I think that governments are just not uh, keeping up with the pace of change in the area of technology. So, what, I mean, you're building new buildings um, at the King of Dallas Economic City as well, but retrofitting old buildings, in fact, we, we talked about this before actually as well, but retrofitting other buildings as well, but with the technology built in there as well. I mean, is SAP working on this as well, looking at how it can provide the software to monitor the performance of these buildings, changing what needs to be changed uh, when we see incredible inefficiencies uh, and wastage as well? Sure, we are working on that, and this is one of our major growth areas. Uh, major growth areas when we measure success in terms of business, but as well major growth if we measure success in terms of contribution to a society, to a sustainable economy. And what do I mean? I want to pick up on your comment. When you, when you made the example with a building, it starts in the design phase. So last year I, I pushed already the message here in Davos that whatever we do, whether this is the uh, whether this is the uh, solar panels, the wind energy, you have to incorporate from the design already sustainable goals. So from cradle to cradle, no waste, 100% renewable. It, and it continues with buildings, it continues with vehicles, and we are helping customers to build these first 100% renewable products. And uh, imagine that every spare part you need on a solar panel, every spare part you, you need when you have wind energy production is built from material that can be 100% recycled. Then you, you have, a, you have a, a system that renews itself. And this is where we are heavily working on. Of course, and now it, your question comes, how are we doing it? The driver is technology. Mm -hmm. The driver is that we incorporate machine learning, artificial intelligence into the system that uh, we, we offer the possibility to consume software as a service, not just energy as a service, software as a service, where I'm convinced that this is the default way of, of consuming software in future. And we will see soon a, a situation where companies massively go out of their own data centers. Otherwise, they miss the point on becoming an intelligent enterprise. You need to have other infrastructure and hardware, so compute, storage, and network, which is perceived a commodity, will become a differentiating capability. As only if you have TPUs, TensorFlow processing units, or GPUs coming from the gaming industry, you are able to process this amount of data in real time, and I want to confirm, you need real-time processing of data, otherwise you will never get your speed. So when we are talking about the, the smart city or the, the green city and everything, as you know, India has a big plan. 200 new more cities is required. And first city is coming in Andhra Pradesh. It's called uh, the, the uh, Amravati cities. And it is in a quite advanced stage is there. What we have done in a, in a Sudlon five years before, we have built our campus, which is our global headquarters in Pune. And that is the greenest campus in the world. When we say greenest, look simple. So it is a more 
a technologically sustainable building which will be the future generation of these cities. So it's a showcase of the model is there, which is the highest rated campus in the world, Lead Institute, Washington DC. It's a 56.5 rating. So out of 58 points. When we build that, it's required the material selection also. Then it's uh, the all 100% in energy uh, for renewables, wind and solar on site. Plus we have a 40% energy efficiency technology, air conditioning, mm -hmm. the data and uh, all the equipments and everything. Top of that 100% the waste management within the campus and rainwater harnessing 100% to use all, all over the years. So nothing single drop or single wastage is going outside the campus to there and we are not taking outside anything inside. Mm -hmm. So that is a, the name is, the campus name is uh, One Earth Within Earth. Do people know that their buildings are so inefficient as well? Who's leading this as well? I mean, I, I mean, I, you've already had a got involved in this as well, but you've talked to me about the buildings and the great gains we can make from having more efficient buildings. The people are, are they aware of what they can actually do in their buildings, or does it come as a revolution to them, or that they can actually retrofit their buildings and, and, and actually connect them digitally as well? <laughs> Yeah, but we have to think differently about the buildings. Okay, everybody knows that there is this potential of efficiency, but still in our mind we think that making them much more efficient and it's, it will cost a lot of money, it's going to be a lot of hard work, you're going to have to exit the building for the next six months and then repatriate in the middle of the dust. That's kind of over. Mm. In many buildings, ju just switch off everything which is not used in, in every room of your building. When we instrument a building, you can do that very fast, Payback, paid by energy or savings, less than three years, and then a lot of collaterals. I mean, then suddenly you can control your room from your phone, you can know if your parking is full, you can know where. So you have plenty of collateral by digitizing the environment and, and understanding how to better use the building. Um, and at KPMG, are you, are you advising people on this one as well? You didn't think you'd have to get involved this early, did you? But, but at KPMG, I mean, you've done a lot of work on this one as well. Um, what have you found out from this about people's reluctance to get involved in the digital economy? Or, or actually, aren't they reluctant? Do they really want to encompass this? Yeah, no, I, I think they are very engaged and wanting to do more. Where, what I typically advise clients of is... The digital age is coming because it's an extension of our smartphones. It's not that we're all wanting necessarily to be... Hang on, it starts with the smartphone. It's, and a Tesla is an extension of your smartphone. Okay. It's all about making your life easier and making your life simpler. Yes. And that's where digital takes us. And I have to agree completely with what Akon said. Disruption is everywhere. So the establishment is being disrupted at every point along the line. And that's what we're here to uh, help our clients with. Mm -hmm. But I love the smart cities, smart technology conversation. I read this very dystopian view of what the future could look like in an LED and energy friendly environment where we basically never turn anything off, ever. And they're talking about creating light free zones so that you could still see the stars at night. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we have to get very smart about how we, how we use the resources that our planet has to, to bring us and make it an energy-friendly, sustainable world. Thank you very much indeed for your contribution. Uh, and just coming back to you, who is build, you are building this city from scratch as well. What's the most common mistake apart from getting the wrong architect? <laughs> <laughs> I have made every mistake in the book. Well, you've been doing it for 10 years now. So just, just tell me, what is the most obvious pitfall in creating this, this smart, digitized set of conurbations stroke city? Look, we, we um, and to be honest, we, we are super practical about the decisions we make. And I think that the biggest area, the biggest threat uh, in the area of increasing renewables and increasing efficiency is government subsidies of energy. As you all might have heard, Saudi Arabia launched Vision 2030. And part of it is subsidy reform. So they actually removed some of the subsidies on energy and electricity. And as such, this is the first year we make an investment in solar. Sorry, you want to get back? This is the first year you made the investment in solar. Because every time we ran the numbers, it didn't make, didn't make sense. Look, it's nice that we have solar on the roof, but it didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. This is the first time it actually made sense. So we created a new diesel plant with 20% of the solar. From, Who's uh, building from, those solar panels? <laughs> Are you going to open in Saudi Arabia? Or? <laughs> yeah, we can huh? build uh, another two. We're doing two, business, two, right? Yeah. <laughs> two, 200 megawatt projects. Yeah. No, but uh, uh, you all for Saudi Arabia? Yeah, we are working and uh, planning to build uh, because very soon uh, they are coming wind and solar, almost uh, 400 megawatt, very large mega projects 
the Saudi Arabia is planning. And as you know, the today the re renewable energy is a reality. I think yeah. uh, it's no more alternate energy. It's a mainstream energy because in the last three years, almost one trillion dollar investment has already invested in a renewable uh, the space. It is almost sixty percent of the the total energy basket. It's so the it's sophistication going very well. of the PV and the photovoltaic and the, and the whole process that you're using. Is it different from what Acon is doing in Africa as well? If so, why? No, no. Africa also we have built uh, the 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 wind projects 150 megawatt in South Africa. So it's nothing different uh, the wind and solar. And now the new trend is moving for the all emerging economy market is the system design and system solutions for mainly for the wind and and solar hybrid solutions because that is the the giving feature. If you see the 2040, almost 12 trillion dollar investment will follow in the power sector. Out of that, nearly 70% will come from the renewable space. The 40% of our vehicles by 2040 will be converted into electrical vehicles. And energy efficiency, 40% will be withdraw the whatever energy we are consuming is, is reduced by for 2040, okay. the 40%. The beauty is that okay, this is a digital energy, I can say. It's not using any fuels or anything. It's we are producing through the, through the natural resource but wind and uh, the sun which is abundant is available. But when we go to the manufacturing and all these value chain areas, it is driven by the digitally and lots of value additions in a, in a thing, whether it is in a supply chain management, whether it is in a technology design development area, whether it is in a construction of the projects and, and, and every life, stage and life is type a digital management. element to it. Yes. Music to the ears of certain gentlemen in this room as well. Did you want to come in on this one as well about the panels? Oh yeah, I want to be a partner. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go, that's perfect. This gentleman is just saving me, by the <laughs> way, because invest. I was about to lecture you all, because I, what part of I want you all to get involved did you miss? And I, and I will start picking people. I'll be like that history teacher, just picking people out at random. So who are you and what do you want to add to this conversation? My name, uh, my name is Dennis O'Brien. Um, we're talking about wealthy countries here, but how can you bring power to Burkina Faso or Haiti and take all this wonderful technology and put it in there so that you know, can change those economies. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And it tallies, if I may, to bring that into the next section, which is about investment. So we're not talking about just paying for it in the Western world or in Saudi Arabia, which, dare I say, has money to spend on this and make the mistakes that you've made as well. We're talking about the whole world, the emerging world as well. Who's going to pay for this? Why don't you start off? I think we all together have the obligation uh, that uh, what I said in terms of collaboration and openness, that we can't pass the obligation to pay for it to Burkina Faso. So we, we have to take responsibility for the entire Which planet. was what COP21 was partly about as well. And, and that is allowing the countries to industrialize yes. without having the constraints. And that is the beauty of technology because imagine when you have a new city, where in, whether it's in Saudi Arabia or Burkina Faso, if you start from design on building a digital twin, that means that you have everything under control. And I want to pick up on the comment, just switch, do the easy thing, switch off the light, the air conditioning when you are not at the building over the weekend. A digital twin with an intelligence in it can do that automatically. And then these projects uh, will pay off automatically because there is not just a contribution to the society in these countries. This is as well uh, a contribution of showing the impact to the planet, which pays off on the balance sheet as well. And yet, and, and this, this is not about America, I'm not turning this into a pro-Trump, anti-Trump, but hasn't it been very, very clear with the PTCs that were expended, extended for wind quite recently, as opposed to the tariffs that have been put off on production of solar panels in some part of the country, the role that taxation uh, at the border and indeed inside a country can make as well. The role of taxation, the role of government is still very, very important, isn't it, as well? I mean, do you want to pick up on this one as well? And again, this is yeah, not about Mr. Uh, Trump. This is about the role of government and how they can direct money. Correct. No, it's an initial stage. It was required incentivized to, to pick up this sector and everything. Honestly, if you ask me, tomorrow the, the, the U.S. government should remove the PTC, our market size will be double. So that is the opportunity. It's not no more need any types of the fiscal benefit for this sector. And also when we are talking about the, the country who, who doesn't have a capability to pay, one mil, billion population doesn't have excess of energy. Now the coal energy price versus this, two cents to four cents 
dollar, we are producing this energy. So it is an extremely affordable energy is there. Now who will invest this? Absolutely very clear. There is a huge financial funds are available. Huge pension funds groups are there. They are heavily investing in these sectors and, and making that happen. It's not required to invest by country, not required by to consumers, and they will invest. The consumer has, has an opportunity to get 25 years the fixed rate power, 2 cents to 4 cents. So mm -hmm. it is a win-win situation. It is a lower than call, call so based power plant. scale creates lower price, and obviously yes. the technology moves on and, very and quickly. And potentiality well. is growing in a substantial Everyone, wants to, play. Scale everyone wants to play on this one, right? You come in first, John Pascal? Yeah, that's right. Do you need a mic? I mean, we no, can say probably that. probably not. No. What I, I would like to, to add to that is that there is financing, right? Yes, on, on huge. The, don't believe that the people are not spending money on energy. Even if you are in Burkina Faso and you don't have access to energy, you spend money on collecting things, wood, whatever. Uh, oil uh, to to uh, uh, to produce energy. Mm -hmm. So it has a cost. Actually, every time we do microgrid, it results in a cost decrease for the populations. Mm -hmm. What is really important is to find the right model of implementation, and it goes with skilling people so that they can maintain their installation. But it's not one model fits all, um, is it? No, it's no. country by country, yeah. community by community. Probably shaking the establishment, as you say, but more so. Uh, really being very close to them to understand what works. Okay. On finances, there is financing. Yes. And more than $100 billion funds are it's available. There is no projects. Mm -hmm. So it's a fund is not an issue. Only required a right uh, should the be business an model, the central bank business model so and, and government systems can support the policy framework. It's enough. Akon, you want to come on this? Yeah, because that's, that's actually a topic that confuses me heavily. Why? Because... Everywhere we go, they tell us the funding is available. Everywhere we go, they say, we raised 30 billion for Africa. We did this, that, and the other. The money's out there, but where is it? And what confuses me even more is that even if a country is qualified to spend that money, the regulations that they put in place are so difficult to meet that majority of these African countries can never get the advantage to be able and, to utilize and those this funds. this is because of what? Vested interests? It's clearly vested interest because African countries aren't governed by the country or the people. So the people really don't have say in where those resources go or how those resources are being leveraged for the benefit of the country itself. So who is in control? Are you blaming same no, old No, there's MNCs? no blame. There's just confusion. Okay. I, 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 is it possibly international companies which are well, the, the same old tragedy of Africa? It's not Africa, so it's everybody else. <laughs> Do you want to come in? And then the Fahad's going to come in afterwards. Yeah. You know, is, it, is it inconceivable that the wealthy countries pay and, and have a small fee, like a 0.1 of 1 cent per kilowatt hour, to put it into a fund? Because, you know, if you're down in Haiti where there's no grid that works properly, the government spends 250 million, about 12% of their budget a year, subsidizing mm -hmm. electricity and they cannot get access to investment capital. You now have all the technology, which is cheap as chips compared oh, where it was 10 years ago. But you know, should the wealthy world pay or into a fund to help fund this? Because you cannot get money, if you're a country like Haiti, to rebuild your whole electricity or from scratch or build new but infrastructure. Actually, Haiti is a perfect example. Let's, not, let's exclude Africa. Let's talk about Haiti. After the hurricane, they said there was $2 billion raised for Haiti. I went to Haiti after the hurricane. Two years later, it went back to Haiti after the hurricane. Not a penny of that money was spent in Haiti. I want to comment on that. I, I don't think that money is the solution for the problem. If you talk to the president of Haiti, it is. I mean, it is a problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how do you expect to develop with no money? I, I, I do not say that the president is right. Because you work for a company with a massive balance sheet. But if you're the president of Haiti and you're scratching around to even put a microgrid in for a million up in Jeribe, it ain't there. And you have to write 10, 20 reports and prostrate yourself to some you know, institution that provides capital. And then you have to get KPMG to write 10 reports, and you still won't get the money. But yeah, why, 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 why not? Let me trust my money. Gentlemen, care. gentlemen, one at a time. Burn, <laughs> why don't you come you in care. first? Like, the money's on. there, but you can't get it. You can come in a moment. First burn. <laughs> all I'm, saying, I'm loving the energy, though. Everyone else can learn something here, by the way. <laughs> no, but, uh, honestly, all, I'm, all I'm saying, if you know, we put money on the table and give it there, then we heard that the money is disappearing. I don't know in, in which pocket it lands. But why not investing in educating the people, enabling them, 
that they can build it on their own. We had the same discussion with food. Now you can spend money and bring them the food. No, nice, but, but this is not the solution see, of key, the problem. The key word you said was investing. Yes, investing, but you not... You can't invest without no money. Um, so, no, no, can, no, no, can, no, actually, I'm going to let Fahad come yeah, in here, if I may. I mean, money is the, prom, it's the problem. Saudi Arabia, what is it doing right on the education front in terms of STEM and digitalization? What is it doing right now? Because we know that you've got a young population, sometimes a rested population, that actually needs that education. What is it doing really right in terms of educating its people to be, take advantage of IoT and a digital economy? Can I get to that? Just to answer, I, I think this yeah. is an important discussion. There are three billion people that don't have regular access to energy. There's not, not going to be global equality without global uh, equality and access to energy. And, and it's going to get worse from here on. But I, I think, is the fund, are the funds there or are the governments failing? I think governments are failing all around the world. It's a complicated issue. You have to build production. You have to build a network, a grid, a transmit, distribute. Mm -hmm. Nobody's doing that. Did we miss a trick on not having a public servant here that we could beat up on all the, throughout the entire panel? Just one government member. Is anyone actually representing government here at all? I know this gentleman's no, going to come no, in. No, no. <laughs> 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 okay. Who are you, sir? Joe Scalise with Bain and Company. I uh, run our energy practice in the Americas. Um, the topic that I haven't heard anybody bring out here, which I think would be deeply animating. Might be on my list, so just be careful. Oh, okay. Well, uh, pricing, <laughs> the economics. We've talked about what's slowing the Internet of Things down. In the developed world, why aren't people pushing into energy efficiency? Why aren't they doing more? Well, in the developed world, energy is just cheap. It's cheaper to waste it and pay your electricity bill than it is to deploy these technologies or even think about it. And then, as you were saying, in the developing world where there's the need to form capital to deploy, it's not priced there either. Now, the, I'm not saying that who should pay that price, but that's the reason that the $2 billion never shows up is there's no will to collect the revenue on it to pay for it. And I just am surprised in all but we've talked about here. You said no will to collect the revenue. I find Excuse that very me? hard. You said no will to collect the revenue. I find that very hard to believe, sir. Uh, um, I'm not sure that's exactly what I said. But maybe there's, the revenue is not being collected. Right. Um, whether it's in the developed world by just having cheap pricing, mm -hmm. and, and that it's not animating the Internet of Things. And then in the developing world, um, I, I, candidly, I don't know enough about electricity pricing in Haiti to talk about it, but I would suppose that the $2 billion is not showing up because somebody can't see that to be $3 billion in the next three years. Yeah. I, I, I mean, but, but well, the $2 billion is nonsense that went into Haiti, and I agree with Akan. Yeah. Basically, the U.S. did a fantastic job post-earthquake, but they charged out the $2 billion, you know, all their medical sh ships and helicopters and everything that came out of the $2 billion. So it's not really... A re it was admirable what the U.S. did, because there would have been lots more people dead, but it came out of the $2 billion instead of going into health, education, and power. You, I, I mean, Haiti is right beside the U.S. It could be a magnificent investment location, but there ain't no power. And it's, you know, people talk about the, the developed world. It's we have to focus on countries like Haiti. That will stop immigration. That will stop all this Trumpism as well. 1,000%. Well, before, we, before we wander too far afield into climate change and anything else, it's supposed to be what's animating the Internet of Things in the energy space. And I think it has different parts of it. And so I just, I just feel like we've wandered off a little bit in terms of what would it take to drive more energy efficiency, no matter where it is, and the deployment of technology. Give us an uh, excuse me? I'm sorry. I, I would assert pricing, more effective pricing, would actually cause consumers mm -hmm. in the developed world to actually pull these technologies in rather than have them either regulated in or to have them be something that we talk about here that don't end up manifesting themselves. Well, I actually disagree about the pricing aspect of it. Because in Africa, there's no energy to price. I agree. That might and in Haiti, in. there's no energy to price. I think the pricing could make a difference in developing countries, but the pricing actually benefits the big oil giants. They want you to waste the energy. They don't want to conform to something that's going to help you save energy because they lose money. So the pricing is not as, like, I don't think it's such a huge issue more than the accessibility and the consumption itself. I think the consumption is the role that the digital players will play that will help to regulate the pricing. And then at that moment, they don't really have control over the pricing anymore. And I think that's the pushback. Um, you're absolutely right. We do need to get back onto the digitalization side of this debate as well. But Ian Con, you spent a large part, you're Centrica, of course, the CEO. You spent a large part of your career at one of these major oil companies as well, BP. So do you want to just come back to that point as well? And then obviously you've got another point to make as well. Well, let me start 
slightly different place, and I'll come back, I promise, to Africa and, and oil giants. So <clears throat> first thing, I'm an optimist. Why am I an optimist? In 1980, it took 0.56 tons of oil equivalent to generate $1,000 of GDP in the world. Today, or 2016, it's 0.17. It's, it, we've taken it down by two-thirds. So we've, we know how to do this stuff, and it's accelerating. So that, that's the first thing that gives me optimism. The second thing that gives me op optimism, and, and Jean Pascal talked about it, is that the trends that are driving the change now are to a more distributed energy system, which means more and more people are in control of it. Secondly, customers are becoming more powerful, and society is choosing what they want, and politicians listen to voters. And the third thing is digitization is accelerating the whole thing and making it more efficient. So those are the reasons I'm optimistic. Now, on the Africa question and <clears throat> resource owners and, and, and what, what's the potential solution? In my time at BP, when we were in Angola, we were putting solar into villages. We were doing it in collaboration with the government. Every mineral extraction company in Africa ends up doing social programs. It would be brilliant if the governments would actually ask all in one country, in each country, Mr. Mining Company, Mr. Oil Company, we've got one thing we want you to work on right now, not your pet road near your, near your operation. Let's just put solar in together. And I think it needs, unfortunately, action by local governments to, to really force people who are participating in their economy to do this. Second thing it needs is a funding mechanism, an international funding mechanism, and we should be able to do that. And then it needs a supply chain to be able to fulfill it. I do think this is possible, but unfortunately, local government's attitude to, and their relationship with contractors in their country needs to change. Thank you very much indeed for that, Ian. Okay, look, I need to move on, though, because um, I'm way <coughs> behind as usual. Digitalization, which smart and sustainable technologies are best hopes for powering demands of the future population as well. I'll start off with the panel, but have a think. Anyone who hasn't played, this is your chance. We're an intimate gathering. You will enjoy it. You will feel great that you actually got involved in this conversation. <laughs> Trust me, feel confident. You can do it. Which technology? Who wants to kick off with this one? Bert, I haven't heard from you for a little bit as well. Yeah. What technology? I mean, SaaS is the, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the key word in your business these days, software as a service as well. But is there something particular within that that you think is the key technology? I know you're big on the green cloud as well. One, one thing is the way you consume software, which is software as a service, but we as well need to understand that the technology itself will change as we have distributed producers of energy, prosumers, so consumers will get uh, as well a production unit. The same happens with the software itself. We will, we will get such a huge amount of data that we will soon reach a point where we have to give up the notion of a central data center. We will go in massively distributed uh, data storages at the edges, at the solar panel, in a train, in a Tesla, whatever you want to use as an example. And these sources of information will trigger actions. While in the existing world, you first define the process, you insert data, and then you trigger action. So it is completely reverting the flow how business processes, and in this case as well, the process of energy production and consumption uh, will be managed so in the future. So we need to go micro. I mean, this is the same problem that the big industrials are facing at the moment. The big gas turbines aren't selling necessarily. People have got to think about micro solutions. So is, is that the technology you're talking about, backed up by digital? Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about, if you use the example of a turbine, there will be local storage of information within a turbine. Mm -hmm. And then you need software that has intelligence to understand which kind of information do I have to transfer, whatever, into a central service center. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about it, to have condition monitoring, to have predictive maintenance capability. And you will save hundreds of millions of euro or dollars or whatever currency you want to use. Because Bitcoin, Bitcoin expensive service, maybe. <laughs> uh, and why? Because you go away from a checklist-based maintenance and support of these facilities into a predictive capability. And then the costs for maintaining these facilities is massively lower than we have today. And then we come to the openness. Do you want to have all these service technicians locally? Or do you want to engage and give the people locally a chance to help maintaining this? Because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm with you. If, if we are not enable, enabling them in Africa or wherever in the world, 
of running and operating their systems on their own, it will fail. And technology is there to enable them. Fahad, do you want to come? You're, you're looking at so many technologies. You're being offered so many yeah. technologies. You're being offered so many new, great ways to run a city as well. You can't name one technology. I know you can't. But where's your focus? How are you sorting think, out the uh, wheat from the, the chaff? The I'll start off with Fahad first, and I'll come to you afterwards, I promise. Okay. I think building ma management systems uh, yeah. that allow you to understand your energy use. I think most consumers really don't understand how they use their energy at home un until they get the bill at the end of the mm -hmm. month. And then they don't know how to lower it, so they uh, put the lights off. Or they don't know, for example, that that uh, washing machine was the reason why you're paying so much for it. Don't mention energy. washing machines. The Americans are in town tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> A few of you got that anyway. So, so I think building management <laughs> systems uh, that are like consistently giving you information about how much you're, uh, you're using energy right now. Uh, would help a lot. I, I think the future energy is need a huge technological uh, change. And that is the reliable, affordable, sustainable energy for the each and every smallest village we can do. The system design is a very critical is there rather than going a big infrastructure and big uh, grid setups and everything. So it will migrate in a very fast way through digital technology, through IT system area. It's a regional focus area. The wind, solar, storage, and distribution systems integrated, and through digital technology, you can manage the load management, forecasting, scheduling, all these integrated uh, the systems. And it is a very standalone. Very, I'm not going a small distributed. It will be the sub system will be small distributed, but as a regional basis. So it will become a uh, the the safe fail because uh, today the biggest new risk is increasing when we are going more and more digital uh, things and everything. If, uh, if the cyber security is uh, impact and other thing. So I'm delinking on a regional spaces rather than integrating my all country systems. Mm. If, it, if, if cyber security is damaged, it will kill the blackout on the complete uh, half part of the country or something like that. It, it seems so to me it, it, is, it is the biggest uh, downside risk of the, yeah. the innovative technologies because there is a, so it's a very regional spa focus area. It's, it's to go top of that the whole city is not just one city, but there is a four, five cities, 20, 30 villages in that. Any... All the vehicles should be on electrical systems. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a slightly different question. India, should, everything should be right for India. You've got this amazing, young, smart population. What is India, and again, I need a fairly short answer on this one as well. What is India getting right in digitalization, and why isn't it getting everything right? I can't understand it. You've got this I, stunningly I today, smart today, young population. Today is a huge leadership of India for the world is there in IT and technology. is the, the smartest brain we have in all over the world, and they are developing. And most of the global companies are establishing their back office design management everything you will Which is exactly my point the so british why are there so british airways is a system is the managed from the delhi completely yeah. all the british airways flights and everything so lots of centers are moving on that uh, things so india has a biggest strength of the service industries yeah. i can say so if it is a travel business is there the world will gradually has a global hub of the travel will be in india like that. If it is a, your uh, the supply chain management or e-commerce management, okay. the total system design will be at uh, hub I'm now against India the clock, okay, for the world. See. Thank you very much for that. Akon, the technology. The, 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 I mean, we've, we've had big solutions, smaller solutions. What's your solution? Um, is that in energy or just in, in general? In, in, technology in digital general. economy, uh, tying up with energy, making this work for Africa, making it work for the whole developing world. Well, like you said, I think there's so many technologies that exist today. Um, but definitely from a consumption side, I think that would definitely help if you digitize the consumption to a standpoint where the data is clearly being read and understood by mm -hmm. the consumer. Ian, you want to come in again? I'll, I'll take a, a brief comment from you. Very quick one, which yeah. is just I, I want to I totally agree with what Fahad and Akon just said. Changing the relationship of the customer with their energy is fundamental. And finally, and we haven't talked much about IoT, finally the technology exists for customers to be in control and change their relationship. We, we're nearly at a million people who've got, a, we are a competitor of Nest, <clears throat> three to five percent immediate energy savings. Yeah. It's fundamentally changing people's relationship with their energy. They're in control, they can choose, and then they go from there. So that's what I think we need to do. Focus on the customer and the demand side. Well, let's get a comment from this lady here. I, I'm, and this gentleman's coming as well. Now you're all coming out of the woodwork when you've got four minutes left. I like <laughs> it. <laughs> Who are you, madam, and what would you like to say? So my name is Olga, and I'm a politician in my country. I'm a member of I know Parliament. why you didn't own up so earlier on. I, okay. I, I would like to make two comments. I 
I totally agree with what you said, but I have my angle. I am only able to make the right decisions and remove all the subsidies if my voters have control over how they value energy mm -hmm. in their life. And this is where, what I beg you guys. Forget about big guys, corporations, work on each and every household and make sure that every mama and papa can switch off all the lights and appreciate energy as valuable source of you know, living and educating people and everything else, not as cheap energy because they always pay very high, uh, you know, high price for it. Thank you. Thank you, Olga, that's great. Uh, and this gentleman here. Oh, mine is a simple question. Um, my name is Chris, and I run the Center for Unintended Consequences of Technologies. So I would love to hear what you guys are doing in terms of uh, what could go wrong. Uh, you know, we're thinking about the positive, like everything's going to be great. But you mentioned a little bit about, you know, hacking and, and all other issues. So what could go wrong with this, you know, digital uh, And economy? may I add to your question before we get going? And I think it's a brilliant question, so thank you. Um, um, isn't the status quo what could go wrong? Isn't it we just stay where we are or we move very slowly is what could go wrong as well. But I know you've all got points on this one as well. So who wants to kick off? Yeah, it's, it's a cyber security. When we are talking about it's just related to data. That's never mind work first, cyber security. But now it's a, it's a technology is running. Assuming a big 2,000 megawatt power plant is running, and the whole system is running on a, on a digital systems. And the SCADA system and monitoring the safeties and everything is on, on, a, on, a, on a tips of the, the, the mobile systems, is a working is there. And if that's the cyber security's impact comes, it can be blast the whole power plant in a few seconds. Yeah. That nothing uh, can, nobody can control in that because we have a safety security everything. And we have a within our system also, there is a second security, third security, four securities. But now technology of the, the cyber securities are going so faster than normal technology growth. So they can b go ahead of this, all the walls and, and correct that. And then it, it, it is a disaster for the, the human life. And then blackout or other thing. Like our wind turbine is run. It's a very smart uh, control management system is there. Without person is running 24 by seven and, and, and 25 years without any people on the, on the machine and sites. But it's a very heavy and very big size of machine is there. If something goes wrong on by digital system is, it's, a, it's, a, it's broken and then there is a human life risk. Because then surrounding okay. people or surrounding life can lose. It's there. So it is there. Today, I think in our uh, the energy session also, this was the main subject, uh, the discussion. We have to also find out the way how to protect these all large assets of the future. Mm -hmm. Fahad, what can Le go wrong? Leaving people behind, I think. I think we are moving way too fast. And we have no solutions for the 3 billion people that don't have access to energy. I think that is the biggest issue. We're, way, we're moving way too fast. I think we're, we're all going to move. I mean, whether you like it or not, you're going to install the next I thought it was wind going turbine. slow was the problem. No, no, I think now, like, like the, 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 you know, again, the in the developed world, fast. now you have economies of scale on, the, on production of photovoltaics and other and renewable. We're going to install them. Uh, you're going to give us the best BMS system in the world, and we're all going to be fine. Ultimately, this is an economic equation for us, but all of these people who are left behind, who don't have basic grids, and pay already 20 times more what I pay for energy, I, mean, I think that's the biggest issue. Akon. Um I think we're probably moving too slow. <laughs> and because the longer we take, our ozone layer is being destroyed. You know, when you look at the climate issue, it's affecting us more than it's affecting nature. Nature's going to be here. We're not. Nature's not going anywhere. We are. So the longer we take to figure this out, we're the only ones that's going to get damaged by it. So we don't have a choice but to move at fast speed because our lives are in stake at this point. You know, now, whether or not we're capable enough to move that fast or are we mentally uh, uh, in a position to say that I accept the fact that we have to move digital quicker, no, we're not. But we need to be. And when you say what could go wrong, everything's going wrong. That's why we're having this conversation. It's already wrong. Now, when we go into the future, there's less things that can go wrong when you go renewable. Because going renewable, a nuclear power plant is not going to blow up and leave year-long side effects. Going renewable, uh, an oil drill is not going to leak and spill throughout and mess up our, 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 you know, our oceans and water and, and lead into our sewage and, 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 and faucets and things of that nature. Going renewable, if something goes wrong, you just update the format. Acom, 
I don't want to rap you, but I've got to. Okay, but you get the point. <laughs> Follow that. I, I, want to, I want to agree with you. We are moving too slow, and we have all the capabilities in our hands, even to overcome the concerns. And I have heard the concern of cybersecurity. We can introduce threat detection intelligence into every single aspect. We, we do not have to wait until an attack is distributed all over the grid or all over the system. And, and I, I had one conversation with a customer who was saying, but this all comes with digitization. And I told them, if you allow me to, to examine your system, I bet that there is some threat in your system as well. And I just shared a little anecdote what happened. In that company, it was a US-based company, we, we simply analyzed in their whole system landscape normal system behavior mm -hmm. with a machine. The machine had no clue whether you pay out salary, invoices, procure something. And there, there was one little thing. Every month on a Saturday evening, somebody logged in a system. There was a, a financial transaction going to a private account. On Sunday morning, that run was finished. The same person logged in again and changed a figure in the system. Then we analyze it. What, are, what is somebody doing Saturday evening at 10 o'clock in, in your company? It was somebody from the HR department who logged in, transferred money to his private account, mm -hmm. changed the salary back again. So don't assume that when we go digital, yeah. that now suddenly cybersecurity is the big threat. Mm -hmm. the, the, the threat is in the it's system as we as speak. Well. Yeah. And we just have to introduce intelligent threat detection mechanisms if something happens, then the okay. impact is minimal. I'm going so to have to wrap I, you as well, Ben. Thank you very much for <laughs> that. No, I'm, I'm, I'm painfully aware that A, I'm over, B, you're probably yeah. quite thirsty, and C, you've got another party to go to after. So I'm not going to finish it on a downer, though. I'm sorry. So I'm going to, take, I'm going to, I'm going to stop you on 10 seconds each, okay? I want to know what's really going right, what's the best thing about the IoT at the moment, the powering of the digital economy. I will stop you at 10 seconds. I'm going to go right down the line. Do you want to start off? Or do you want a bit of a breather? You can, can start. Go. I, I start. You've got 10 seconds. Uh, I'm excited that the industrial IoT will be a driving force for future economic growth, for society growth, and for a healthy environment. Akon, what's said, going you right? You said everything I said I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> you said it right, brother. He's right. So Next. despite everything, despite your first Davos visit, you're quite excited by it. I know, I'm more than excited. Because I, I mean, otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation. I know everyone in this room is very, you know. Oh, that's made my night as well. Happen, uh, and yourself, Fahad? I think it's uh, going to drive the sharing economy more than ever. Our assets Absolutely. in the energy field are just not utilized sufficiently. Yeah, and until see. I, I strongly believe IoT initiative is give a better life to the, our, our next generation. All right, look, everybody, thank you. I know a lot of you, I know a lot of you aren't natural speakers and you don't want to get up, maybe, but I want to thank Jean-Pascal Tricoire as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, everyone who got involved. But I do want to thank our panel, especially uh, Tulsi Tanti, Bahad Al-Rashid, Akon, it's been a great contribution as well. Uh, and Ben Loikayat, it's really, really nice to hear your views as well. Thank you very much indeed for being such a great audience.